So I want to ask this question. How many have ever had a problem with foundations, like in your house? You had to crack foundation. You had to fix the foundation. What happens if you don't fix the foundation? What happens to your house? It starts to fall. And, of course, the foundation holds everything up. And so it is in your Christian life. The foundation you build yourself on holds everything in place. And there is a foundation of understanding that you have to have to actually walk with security and where God wants you to walk. So we're going to talk about that today uh, out of Hebrews chapter 6. Get your Bibles open to verse number 1. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the discussion of the el- elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, which means maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, um, of the doctrine of teaching of baptisms, of laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, or of eternal judgment. Now, these are all foundational issues that you need to know. If, the, if there's one mentioned there you don't quite understand, you need to find out. That, that is a foundation that you need to stand on and know what it says, what you have, and what God wants you to know about that topic. Well, today, we're going to look at the one of them called the doctrine of baptism. Sounds kind of boring, but it's actually exciting. The doctrine of baptisms. Now, notice right away that it says baptisms, not baptism. And so we need to understand that there's more than one baptism mentioned in the Bible that pertain to your life, and we're going to jump into that. So I think most people think of water baptism when you mention baptism, but that's just one of the baptisms. So let's define our terms. Baptism literally means the word to wash, to dip, to be immersed into something. A baptism requires someone doing the baptism into something, being immersed into something. The word, and I give Rick Renner credit for this. He helped me with the definition. But the the original word baptism literally came from the concept of dyeing cloth where you would dip it and it would come out looking different than it did before. So when you immerse something in baptism, it takes on the character and the flavor of what you immerse it into. So remember that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's get into the word of God. Verse number 12, Paul teaching here. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized or immersed into the body of Christ, whether Jews, Greeks, slaves are free, and we've all been made to drink of that one spirit. Now, here is the first time we hear baptism mentioned that's super important to you. So we ask the question, who is doing the baptizing in this example? It says God is, right? God is, the Spirit of God is baptizing you into what? What are you being immersed into? The body of Christ. So you are being moved, immersed into becoming part of the body of Christ. Now, when does this happen? When you call on the name of Jesus, when you believe upon Jesus in the twinkling of an eye, the Spirit of God brings you into the body of Christ. And so that is being baptized, immersed into the body. First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul continues verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleases. Amen. Now let's move on. Galatians, again, Paul teaching chapter three, verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, there we see again this baptism into the body of Christ. So, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. Again, we talked about this. When you're baptized, you take on the flavor and the character of what you're being immersed into. So it says, there is now neither Jew, Greek, slave or free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. Did you get this? When you're baptized, immersed, you take on the flavor, the character of what you're being immersed into. 
the old you is not you, the, the cloth has changed color, and so there's no longer a definition of nationalities, male or female, we're all in Christ. Got it? Amen. Uh, that's awesome. Now, this is the first baptism, and of course, God does this, the Holy Spirit does it, you don't do it, but I want to show you something out of Acts chapter 10. So let's take a look here. It's the story, you'll, you'll remember, of Cornelius. And Cornelius is a, he's, he's Gentile. He's not, a, he's not a, a Jew. And we're going to find this out here. I'm looking again. What scripture am I looking? Acts, Acts, Acts. Acts 10, right? Okay, wrong direction. Acts 10. <clears throat> the story of Cornelius. You probably know the story. But anyway, Peter has a dream of this uh, sheet being lowered from heaven, and it was full of animals that the Jewish law forbid them to eat. And uh, the Lord spoke to him in the dream and said, you know, kill and eat. And he said, no, no, I can't do that. I never, never want to do that. And God says, whatever I've declared clean is clean. And he, he's thinking, what is, what is this all about, right? Well, Cornelius is this Gentile that an angel appears to, and uh, we'll find out here what happens, but let's pick up the story in verse 27. So Peter goes, uh, is summoned to Cornelius's house. An angel tells Cornelius to go get Peter. And so when Peter gets to Cornelius's house, verse 27, talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware it's against our law for Jews to associate with Gentiles or even to visit them. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came. Now, may I ask why I'm here? All right. So Cornelius answers and said, well, four days ago, I was in prayer. And suddenly a man in shining clothes came before me and said that, you know, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter, he is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So he sent for him. Of course, he's telling Peter what's happened. And Peter goes there. But notice the next verse. He says, we're all here now gathered, anxious to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So then Peter began to speak. Being Gentiles, he's kind of bringing them up to pace on what's happened in the Jewish culture. He talks about... Uh, John the Baptist talks about, you know, Jesus went around doing uh, good and healing everyone and what's happened through Ju Judea. And uh, then he comes down to verse 39 and he says, and we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews in Jerusalem, referring to himself and the, the other disciples. We are witnesses of this Jesus, basically. They killed him by hanging him on a tree but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused, caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. And those who ate with us, we, we are witnesses as well. We ate with him, drank with him. And then he goes on, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, while Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit, came upon those that heard the message, these Gentiles. The circumcised believers, the Jews, were shocked that the gift of the Holy Spirit came on the Gentiles as it had them as well. For they heard them speaking in tongues and prophesying. So let's talk about this. Peter is preaching or teaching the gospel to these Gentiles. He's going through the history of what's happened in Judea about Jesus. And he comes down to this phrase that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now let's set the stage. They know an angel had come before their friend Cornelius. They're not going to doubt what these guys say, right? I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all ears, right? An angel has ordered this event. Cornelius has brought his friends. 
They know about the angel. They are anticipating that the words that Peter speaks are truth. For one thing, because I think to have a Jew speak to them, they know it'd be strange for that to happen also, right? But when Peter spoke the words that who believes in the name, they receive forgiveness of sins, something happened in the supernatural. They were baptized into Christ. They believed. When he said that, they believed. And then the Holy Spirit came on them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon them, which shocked the Jews because it was evidence that God had received them and that they were born again. You with me? So when are you baptized into Christ? When you believe on that name. Peter just said, whoever believes on that name receives forgiveness of sins. Bingo, they believed it instantly and the Holy Spirit came upon them and was evidence to the fact they were born again and accepted by God. And the point I wanna make is that's great, but it proves that water baptism is not required for salvation. Water baptism is not required for salvation. Being baptized into Christ is. And you are baptized into Christ by believing upon Jesus. Got it? That's one baptism, okay? Believing on God. And I want to make sure because there's some confusion in the body of Christ uh, in relation to the water baptism. All right. Now, the second baptism that we find in the Word of God is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it really could be called Jesus' baptism or the baptism by Jesus. We find this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist speaking, referring to Jesus, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire or power. So Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit to the church. Acts, the first chapter, verse 8, talks about this, stating, you'll receive power. Now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples before his ascension. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, all right? And we'll need to talk about this in just a bit, what this means. Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What does a witness do but testify? A witness brings evidence of something. He's stating, okay, this power of God is going to come upon you, which is going to allow you to testify or bring evidence of my reality that I am the Messiah and what I say is true. Okay? Now, this power will come upon you but now let's talk about the disciples in John chapter 20. This is again before he ascends, but he is now appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. So Jesus said to his disciples again, peace be to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, let's, let's talk about this. He breathed on them. Now, notice they could not be born again until he paid the price of sin, right? Now, he's resurrected. He's with his disciples, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. This is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is them being born again, being baptized into the body of Christ. We know that for a fact because he says just a little bit later, do not leave Jerusalem until you receive this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we know for a fact, this is speaking of them being baptized into the body of Christ or being born again, all right? Now, regarding the phrase, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Let's remember what he said to them. I am, I'm, as I was sent by the Father, you are being sent. And they are now carrying the message that he carried of salvation. And he's essentially saying, we read the Amplified Version that says this, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven because of their faith. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. 
and remain unforgiven because of their unbelief. What he's saying is, look guys, let me tell you what your job is. You need to go out and share the gospel of salvation. If you don't do it, they'll be in their sins. Meaning that this is important, guys. I'm sending you with this assignment to carry this message of forgiveness, the good news of the gospel. You got it? Understand? All right. So they're born again. And then in Acts chapter 1, 5, we find the words I mentioned, and being assembled together again, again before his ascension to his disciples after the resurrection, he commanded them, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you've heard me talk about, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, here's our second baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we know that the Bible says that in Acts 1.8, you shall, referring to the same conversation, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria. Now, notice it says comes upon you. When they were born again, the Holy Spirit came in them. They became one. Their spirit became one with God's spirit. They're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so this is a different work of the Spirit of God comes upon you like a cloak which enables you to do the works of God as a witness which testifies of Christ. I'm talking fast, but you can, grit, you can get it, right? You're born again, you're baptized into Christ, but there's a second work of the Spirit of God, a second baptism called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you go through the book of Acts, every time it's mentioned, it says it came upon them. It came upon them. It came upon them, not in them, upon them. All right, for what power to do the works of God, to bring evidence and manifestation of God's kingdom so that those will believe upon the message of Jesus as a witness, right? Now I'm gonna read one, one episode here out of Acts chapter 19 that will give you an illustration of how the book of Acts reads regarding this baptism. And it talks about Paul traveling through Ephesus and he comes across some disciples of God he assumes they're believers. And so he asks this question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, he assumes they're believers already. So he's asking, did they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Remember, all the apostles were told how important this is. Do not go anywhere without this empowerment because you are not equipped to be a witness you need to have this power, this ability to the, have the works of God manifested through your life. And so they said, Jesus said, Do, you, you know, don't leave home without it, basically. So to them at that point in time, it was essential that they took that message with them. And he comes across these disciples and the disciples say, we've, we've never even heard of a Holy Spirit, which was what? Paul doesn't well, then what baptize, baptism did you receive? They said, well, we, we were baptized by John the Baptist. And so he says, well, listen, John the Baptist, his baptism was a baptism of repentance. So he then goes on and begins to tell them about Jesus. Verse four of chapter 19, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus, so he's carrying on a brief conversation and it says, when they heard this, what were they hearing? They're hearing the message about Jesus, right? Paul is telling them about Jesus. And then he says, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is water baptism. So we know that they believed the message. They, after they heard the message, they believed they were baptized, immersed into the body of Christ. They're born again. Paul baptizes them in water, lays his hand on them, and then they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They begin to prophesy and speak in tongues. So in this, this paragraph, we see all three baptisms occurring. They believed upon Jesus. They're born again. They are immersed or baptized by God's Spirit into the body of Christ. You got that? Number one. 
Number two, we could say, we can label them by different numbers, but they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. They received that power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul baptized them in water. We'll talk more about why they did that and why it was so important that they did baptism in water, which is the third baptism. So let's talk about water baptism. I think, I think that many, many, many Christians go through water baptism as a routine and a ritual and miss the whole thing behind it. So we really need to talk about it. So take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's dig into water baptism, okay? I'm talking fast. I know there's a lot here, but as long as you kind of follow along, we'll get through it, all right? It'll be a blessing to you. All right. So verse 18 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter For Christ died for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit of God, through whom also he went and preached, or the Bible really, the word proclaimed, to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And I don't think he was, he wasn't preaching the gospel to them. He was proclaiming his victory to them as he took the keys of hell and death from Satan. He was proclaiming his victory to them, not preaching the gospel to them. All right, you follow me? Okay. The word proclamation would go there as well. In it, in uh, the ark, so, so while God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built... In it, only a handful of people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Or what baptism is he talking about? Not water baptism that doesn't save you. What's he talking about? He's talking about the baptism where you're immersed into the body of Christ or salvation. Let's review it again. This... Noah's ark was a type and shadow, if you will, a symbol of water washing or saving. And so this new birth is a birth of cleansing and washing. And the water is a symbol of what Jesus did when you call on the name of Jesus. So let's read it again. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Also, not the removal of dirt from the body. Washing, in, that's not going to do it. There's no power in that. But the pledge of a good conscience towards God, meaning that this baptism is going to cleanse your conscience of condemnation, cleanse you of guilt. It's going to cause you to be reborn as a new creature in Christ Jesus. It's going to change everything about you. And so the water is a symbol. And in Noah's day, it was a type and shadow of what was to come in the future. And, but now, of course, we use it as the same thing, a symbol to remind us of what Christ did. So a good conscience towards God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into the heavens and is at God's right hand. All right, you with me so far? So this water baptism is a symbol of what happened spiritually. And so, again, in Noah's day, it was a type and shadow of what would happen in the future. Uh, And that water at that season with the ark was a picture or a symbol, if you will, of what this this baptism into Christ did for you. It washed you and saved you just like it would save Noah in the boat. Now, for instance, let me talk about this because how we approach this and why God set it up this way. Let's talk about communion for a moment. I think everyone understands communion, but let's mention out of 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, uh, Paul, uh, Jesus, I mean, yeah, Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. This is verse 23 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. That the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Now, so what is communion? Is there any power in the cup? Is there any power in the bread? No. They are simply symbols to bring you into what? Remembrance of what Jesus said about the bread and about the cup. So when you come into communion, by faith, you are, it goes on and says, for as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So who are you proclaiming that victory to? Yourself. Put yourself in remembrance, he says. You are proclaiming the victory that you have in Christ over sickness, over sin. You're putting yourself in remembrance. So here's what you want to say. What is the bread telling me? Not that the bread's anything, but what is, it, what is God trying to tell me with the bread? What is God trying to remind me with the cup? And if you step into communion by faith, there is an anointing to deliver you and set you free as you set your, set your mind upon what Christ did for you. Now, but so many people just go through it as a rote ritual and never tap into the effect that God had intended for it. So by faith, what did God say? What did the body represent? If you need healing, his body was broken for you. If you need cleansing from sin, you need forgiveness, you have the cup. What does it say? What did Jesus do for you? You're going to proclaim that to yourself and to the devil, who's the accuser of the brethren. You're going to proclaim your victory. You're going to proclaim your healing. You're going to proclaim your, your free from condemnation. You're going to stand there and proclaim it in his face as you've been reminded by the Spirit of God what Jesus did. There is an anointing on communion. Now, the same thing about healing in James chapter 5. And again, I'm using this example. I'll get back to water baptism. This all leads that direction. Is anyone among you sick? In verse 14, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sin, he'll not be, uh, he'll not, he will be forgiven. There's no power in the oil. It's the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith, the prayer of faith. So what, there's no power in the oil, so why did God say anoint with oil? Because what does oil represent? The Holy Spirit. So what you're trying to do to the one you're praying for is reminding them as we are praying that the Holy Spirit is coming upon you to bring healing to your body. If they approach that by faith, they approach that, that event by faith, they'll receive an anointing to be healed, right? The prayer of faith, the prayer of faith. Now, that's an agreement of the one praying for them, with them, and them. In faith, anointed with oil, the Holy Spirit is now healing you. There's an anointing on that. So now let's take that same analogy to our water baptism. We know there's no power in the water. You could take a bath all day, 24 hours a day, every day, and never cleanse yourself from sin. Right? Amen. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who are baptized into Christ... Baptism number one, into the body. We are also baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism, not water baptism, through this baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. This is that immersion into the body. For we all have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Now, this is super, super important. When you're water baptized, if you by faith understand what you're doing, 
you are being reminded of what Jesus did for you. And if you're reminded that your old man is dead, so essentially you have been given power over sin. Sin no longer is your master. Let me finish this. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over us. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lived to God, lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God. So what's happening when you are water baptized, there's no power in the water. But the water is a symbol and a reminder of what Jesus did. When you go under the water, you're being reminded that you have died with Christ. Your nature has been changed. You are free from the power of sin. Sin has no power over you. You can live above sin. And when you come out, it is an illustration of the resurrection of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit in you, which gives you the power to walk out the life God has for you. And so as you, by faith not ritual, by faith, set yourself in agreement with it, there is a very strong anointing. And here's what I believe. I believe by faith, when you do that, there is an anointing to help you break the flesh off. I really believe that. And so why did they baptize everyone in water, you may say? Well, let's go back to Cornelius' house. Remember the Holy Spirit came upon them and then Cornelius is there. Of course, they're all speaking in tongues. Peter then says, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized in water who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Why would they do that? Why was the church instructed to do that? Well, I do believe that it had an anointed impact on them to remind them of what Jesus did for them, that they walk out but I believe it sets them on the course of being a disciple of Jesus. It sets them on the course of following after Jesus. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus himself said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Make disciples. I believe that water baptism sets you in a place of obedience to Christ and sets you on a path of discipleship. And of course, I knew, do know that there's an anointing on that for your freedom as well. But you'll find they always had that involved. When they came to Christ, they always presented to them the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they always baptized them in water. And that is the first command of any believer is to be water baptized if they're truly born again, not a ritual, truly born again. First commandment we have is you are to be water baptized unto Christ in obedience and you, be, you become a disciple of Jesus. So that's the first step. Now, obviously water baptism happens after you're born again. So obviously we don't baptize babies and children because they're not born again. They're, they, don't, they don't need water baptized yet, right? And so you can be water baptized more than once. It is not bearing upon your salvation, but water baptism, like communion, you know, is a great reminder that if I need, you know, I'm just gonna remind myself of what Jesus paid for. I mean, you know, if you're battling something, you know, you're dealing with your flesh, you go, flesh? I'm gonna remind you what Jesus did. I'm, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. The Bible says in Romans chapter six, I'm not a slave to sin. I have been... Sin has been eradicated. I am dead to sin. And so you can be water baptized anytime you want to. But certainly your first responsibility is to be water baptized after you come to Christ. It is a matter of obedience to Christ and a matter of becoming a disciple of Christ. And again, as I said, I believe it does set an anointing in your life to help you strengthen you in remembrance of what Jesus did to overcome the flesh and to remind you that you're, you've, died to, you've died to yourself. You're basically, you're burying the old man. You're, 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 you're saying, I agree, that's, that's dead and gone, and I'm living by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It is, a, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
And so those are the three baptisms that we find in the Bible. When the Bible says doctrines, a doctrine of baptisms, they, that's what they are. There's three. Number one, being born again. God does it. You're immersed, brought into the body of Christ. Number two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're empowered to walk life out as a witness for Jesus. Number three, you're baptized in water, which is for you and can be done by anyone. God does the first one. Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, but anyone can baptize you in water because it's all about you. It's not about who baptizes you. It's about you remembering and setting yourself in agreement with what water baptism is telling you. So again, ask the question, what is the water telling me? What is the action of being baptized telling me? What is it reminding me of? And then again, set your faith in agreement with that. There is a very strong anointing on water baptism. A very strong anointing. Amen.